said it was, it was good to have a Hold your applause for our speaker. Um, I'm Richard Zeckhauser. I'm a professor here. And tonight we have the privilege of having Ken Rogoff give the 2004 Seymour and Ruth Harris Lecture in Public Policy. This lecture series does not have a long pedigree, but it has a very distinguished pedigree. Our previous speakers have been Thomas Schelling, an extraordinarily distinguished uh, scholar who was the economist who played the major role in founding the Kennedy School, uh, James Heckman, uh, a winner of the Nobel Prize in Economics, and Torsten Person, who's one of the people who just helps decide who gets the Nobel Prize in Economics. So I think Ken follows uh, very naturally in this progression. Uh, Ken, though he looks like a relatively young man, has actually had three careers. Um, his first career came, started before I met him, uh, when he uh, was an international grandmaster in chess, something that he's given up for uh, the greener fields of economics. Um, his second career, uh, to which he's now returned, uh, is that of an academic. He's uh, one of the nations, one of the world's leading figures in international economics. He's been a professor at Princeton and then at Harvard, and now once again at Harvard. And his third career, um, he had from uh, uh, 2001 to 2003, where he served as the chief economist and the head of the research division at the IMF. Um, in that position, um, he did a number of important things. Uh, he, one, he reconnected research at the IMF much more uh, forcefully with the latest economic understanding and thinking. And second, in something that receives quite a, a, a great deal of attention and appreciation from a broad swath of the uh, economics audience, is he provided a spirited defense of the IMF and international institutions in general against um, a rather a bitter attack by Joseph Stiglitz, another very uh, distinguished economist. And at least uh, when many of us in this building read that uh, defense, uh, there was great uh, cheers. I just tell you a little tiny bit about uh, Ken's uh, academic contributions. Um, he has always proved himself to be a prescient uh, individual. In the early 1980s, um, he said, look at exchange rates. Notice that you can't predict why, where they are moving. Anybody who's witnessed, for example, um, movements in the last uh, little bit of the dollar against the euro and the euro against the dollar, uh, 
would have a hard time distinguishing it from a random walk, something that he told us would have happened uh, 20 years ago. In 1985, he wrote uh, some influential work, which basically said that a sound approach to monetary policy was to delegate monetary policy to a conservative central bank. And that had, that article ultimately had reverberations around the world, and many of the most successful governments around the world, in fact, uh, did that. In the 1990s, he published an influential article called The Mirage of Fixed Exchange Rates. And many people think that this article actually uh, predicted some of the currency crises that came in the uh, late 1990s. So he's been uh, prophetic on many occasions. Uh, there are a number of students in the audience. Um, I urge any of you who, are who find tonight's talk so intriguing that you really want to go off and study uh, international finance and international macroeconomics, you should get the book that Ken wrote with Maury Obstfeld called Foundations of International Macroeconomics. It has now become a Bible for the field. Uh, without further ado, um, I want to introduce uh, Ken Rogoff. He's going to talk tonight about international debt crises, the next generation. Thank you very much, and uh, thank you, Richard, for the kind introduction. I also want to thank the Kennedy School for inviting me to present the Seymour E. and Ruth B. Harris lecture. It's a, it's a great honor, and most of all, I want to thank all of you for coming. I want to preface my remarks by saying, as Richard noted, from 2001 to 2003, I spent roughly two and a half years as chief economist and director of research at the International Monetary Fund during a tumultuous period that saw historic debt crises in Argentina, Brazil, Turkey, September 11th, an event that was horrific but also tipped the world into a global recession. And at the same time, we saw policy paralysis in major parts of Europe and Japan. Well, meanwhile, the United States was exhibiting, shall we say, spirited spending policies that all mixed together have been leading the world down in uh, our policy euphemism, an unsustainable path of current account deficits, read, they're sort of a meteor pointed at the earth when that has to unwind someday. It was very tense in my first days, uh, endless hours of meetings over uh, Argentina, Turkey, et cetera, and uh, deciding how to deal with the, the global downturn after September 11th. And I, I, I guess I uh, showed the tension because once Jacob Frankel, who a few of you may know, but he was my predecessor's predecessor at the International Monetary Fund. He's a very colorful individual. He describes himself as uh, my, my uh, grandfather for that reason. But he looked at me and he said, Ken, don't be so glum. Don't you know that a recession is to an economist what a plague is to an undertaker? You should cheer up. <laughs> now, um, I, still, uh, I still have a fairly sober uh, view of things. and. The theme for tonight's talk was really uh, inspired in part by a dinner I was at at the World Economic Forum in Davos uh, just a few weeks ago where the theme was, our emerging markets out of the woods? And uh, I could go through the whole evening, but uh, most memorably, several speakers stood up and said, we have to make sure we never have another emerging market debt crisis. And others said, it's OK. This time is different. The countries have learned their lessons. Investors have learned their lessons. Well, this dinner inspired me to uh, go home uh, shortly after and write the following piece, which was just published in Newsweek International yesterday. It's very short. And I'm actually going to read it to you verbatim, because I think it uh, gives my viewpoint on this as succinctly as I can put it. So I'm now going to read this uh, short piece to you. From the way money is now pouring into middle-income countries like Brazil, China, and Turkey, people must believe that we won't see another international debt crisis until the next sighting of Halley's Comet. Has everybody forgotten about Mexico, 1994, Thailand, South Korea, Indonesia, and others, 1997? 
Russia, 1998, Argentina, 2001, Turkey, 2001, and Brazil, 2002? They shouldn't. According to a foreboding study issued last fall by the International Monetary Fund, when incidentally I was still chief economist there, at least a dozen other emerging markets have more debt than they can handle. Simply put, the average emerging market country has a debt to income burden similar to that of a rich country, pyramided on lower exports and a tax base less than half as large. A recipe for catastrophe. Yes, there are exceptions. Brazil, for example, has gotten pretty good at collecting taxes. And yes, the task of judging whether a country can outgrow its debt burden is not a science. Country defaults have complex social and political dimensions, and I have yet to see any framework that can convincingly name the time or place of the next big crisis. But one didn't have to be Nostradamus to foresee Argentina's recent collapse. Facing persistent budget deficits and volatile world prices for its goods, Argentina fought in vain to maintain a rigid currency peg to the dollar. Only the United States can print dollars. Are the investment geniuses of the world concerned? It's hard to see it in the interest rates they're charging corporations and governments in emerging markets. When Brazil was on the verge of collapse in August 2002, and before it was bailed out by a $45 billion loan from the IMF, it had to pay a whopping 24% above U.S. Treasuries. Now, just above 4% extra, not that much larger than many individuals pay on their mortgages. Does that make sense, given these countries' checkered credit histories? Let me tell you, it's a lot easier for the local bank to seize your house or car than it is for Citibank to get to a deadbeat sovereign debtor. Some say this time is different. Exchange rates are more flexible. Global market.
amount of crises that is get repaid by some countries in order to get ready for the next round this time it's different sure right anyway i want to tell you that when i wrote that i had no inkling that hugo chavez of venezuela would do a twenty percent devaluation yesterday but that happened and since i have just a little more time tonight i think there are a few points that I want to add to this and uh, expand on. Point number one, crises have been around since the dawn of lending. They were around before the IMF, which was started up in 1946. They were around before the Washington Consensus and indeed before George Washington. Today's emerging markets did not invent default. Germany, France, Austria, Spain, Portugal have all defaulted more than half a dozen times. In fact, I mentioned Venezuela at nine. The all-time record holder is Spain at 13. And France is no slouch with eight. They actually had a very routine way of uh, dealing with defaults back under the monarchs, which they would round up the creditors and behead them, which was, I guess, a form of debt restructuring that they had back in those days. And you know, the United States, while not as famous for its, uh, for its debt problems, had a horrible banking problems in the 19th century, and of course a bloody civil war. I think something that many commentators forget is that the transition from being a poor country to being a rich country is a very difficult and chaotic one. It is very seldom smooth, which leads me to point number two. You will see many people point to India and China and say, why doesn't Latin America learn from them? Why don't they look at the lessons of India and China? This is just stupefyingly naive. What they don't understand is that India and China today are still very poor countries. India has a per capita income of $500 per person, even after all its growth. China, which of course is emerging on the world stage, if you use market exchange rates, it's still only $1,000 per person. You cannot compare the development problems of an India or China with, say, a Korea, which has a per capita income of $10,000 per capita, or many Latin American countries, which are nearly as large. I think the right way to think about it is many of these other countries in Latin America, they had their big spurt 100 years ago. And India and China are finally starting to catch up and this transition is a very difficult one. And one of the reasons we most see crises in countries in transition is one of the fundamental stages of development, once you get past a certain point, is developing your credit markets. And it is not easy that crises are, are the rule. And I think if you look at China today, China is investing 40% of income. I mean, this is double what most countries invest. It's growing because it's investing so much. That is the main reason it's growing. And that policy does not work indefinitely. We have models of this, and they seem to hold true. It peters out after a while. And what many countries confront, what many leaders confront, is they're growing for a while, and eventually they have to try something else. And as Ron McKinnon wrote about 30 years ago, and many Latin American countries experimented with in the 70s, is you need to deepen capital markets. If you're saving 40% of income, you have to find a way to channel this to more efficient investments. And when you do that, uh, many of the problems, crises, bubbles, are things you start to make yourself uh, vulnerable to. And I, I, I think we, we need to constantly improve our policy advice. We have to work hard. Uh, the international community has many false ideas, and there are many areas of improvement. But some of what is written about emerging market debt crises is sort of, you know, why didn't uh, the IMF do this? Why didn't the Treasury do this? They never would have happened. You've got to be kidding. I mean, you have never, people have never looked at history who have that uh, simple interpretation. Which uh, brings me to a third point, which is I think one area where we do have some understanding and where there are fairly systematic mistakes comes to the area of trying to fix your exchange rate. A policy which incidentally is not a bad idea for developing countries that are poor, at least according to research I've done, but is extremely risky for emerging markets and frankly every debt crisis we've seen over the last uh, 10 years 
with the possible exception of Brazil 2002, which was tamer than, than some, had a fixed exchange rate uh, at its root. And uh, Dick mentioned that I'd written about this uh, more than 10 years ago with Maury Opsfeld and well before the Asian crisis as uh, really being the problem. And in my view, fixed rates were the root source of crises, and many commentators, especially on the Asian crisis, don't focus on it enough. And I, I, I feel if we had had flexible exchange rates in the Asian crisis, we would have seen a mini crisis instead of a maxi crisis. Commentators like Bhagwati, Roderick, and Stiglitz are right to emphasize that we need to have a nuan nuanced view towards capital controls, and again, my work supports that. But in my opinion, it's not problem number one, which is fixed rates, and it's not problem number two, which is government borrowing. Capital controls are on the private sector to stop the private sector from borrowing. The I, a paper I did while I was at the fund was on, entitled Debt Intolerance that looks at the history of emerging market debt crises, finds that the vast majority has government borrowing at the root. You can look at the Asian crisis, I think, was different, although a lot of the borrowing was government guaranteed. And one of the things that we see is that countries that tend to default once seem to have weakened institutions and default again and again. And it's an interesting thing which I think economists need to study, something I want to think about now that I'm back at, at, uh, at Harvard. And perhaps the Asian countries were right to bend over backwards to avoid their first restructurings because many of them have, uh, have never defaulted. Many people think that the International Monetary Fund is opposed in principle to debt restructuring. That is absolutely not true. And I certainly can say I never was. And if we look at Argentina today, which is still in a catastrophic situation, its creditors need to take a huge haircut. That's the uh, expression, a huge reduction uh, in the value of their debt in order to have Argentina resume growing in order to achieve a realistic outcome. I, I admit that what Argentina is proposing at the moment, which is like a 92 percent uh, write down of debt, some creditors feel is more like a beheading than a haircut, but uh, that will get sorted out over time. And uh, I've, I've made many proposals along these lines 15 years ago that I, that I still think are right. And I might add that international financial institutions may themselves need to see a change of their balance sheets, in some sense a restructuring at some point, and the events in Argentina may actually force that. Something thing a lot of people don't realize is that the International Monetary Fund and the World Bank, which incidentally are run by the same people, although you wouldn't know it from some of the polemics, uh, have fairly limited funds and they're, they're, they're relative to the size of world trade, relative to the size of world's markets. They're very small. And again, contrary to what a lot of the polemics write, the, uh, their leverage is, is fairly limited. In today's world of deep capital markets where China's reserves are roughly triple all of the IMF's resources, India's reserves are bigger than the IMF's resources. The IMF really doesn't have a lot of money to bail out emerging markets, and in many situations it's forced into a situation where, I guess, uh, 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 like a man drowning in 20 feet of water and you throw him eight feet of rope, uh, it doesn't work very well. But um, that, for that reason, they, they have relatively uh, little leverage. Um, I think uh, I uh, just want to close on a, uh, a, couple, uh, a couple remarks of random issues. I think that, that covered my main points. Uh, one is that I do think if we're talking about debt crises, the United States is one of the big problems facing the world today. It's not so much that the United States is going to have an Argentina-style debt crisis. It's that the fallout from United States voracious borrowing could lead to huge changes in exchange rates that a lot of the world might not be um, very able to take. Another major issue in the world scene today is something that's fundamentally good, which is the emergence of China. But China has somewhere between 150 million and 280 million surplus workers, depending on uh, whose estimates you, you, you look at. And as these workers become enfranchised, it also is going to have major impacts on, uh, on the world economy. <clears throat> I have um, one further thing I was going to uh, 
uh, read to you. I'll just, uh, I'll just read a paragraph of it, and I hadn't really planned to read the whole thing, and I'll close with that, which is uh, the uh, IMF deals primarily with international financial crises, and the World Bank is supposed to take charge in development, and they're supposed to work together, uh, although at, at, at times, sometimes for good reasons, sometimes not, they've worked at cross purposes. And I'm just going to read you a, a, a paragraph uh, from uh, uh, a foreign policy piece that I also just wrote. Indulge in a dream scenario for a moment. Suppose the world awoke tomorrow and miraculously every country suddenly enjoyed the same per capita income as the United States, or $40,000 per year. Global annual income would soar to $300 trillion, or more than 10 times what it is now. And while we're at it, suppose also that international education levels, infant mortality rates, and life expectancies all converge to rich country levels. In short, what if foreign aid worked and economic development happened overnight instead of over centuries? I won't read the rest, except I'll tell you the title, The Development Nightmare and it explores what rich countries must actually be thinking when they worry about that prospect. Um, thank you, and I'll be happy to take questions. So, um, thank you, Ken. That was, that was a very pr provocative presentation. We have some ground rules for questions at the Kennedy School. We have four microphones, one here, one there, one there, and one there. If you want to ask a question, please come up to a microphone. We'll call on people in turn. When you get to the microphone, identify yourself. So explain your name and where you come from. And then ask a pithy question. The question is short, and it ends with a question mark. So please come to the microphones, and um, uh, Ken will address your question. My name is Bhakti Merchandani. I'm a first year student at HBS. You mentioned that a way to avoid future debt crises were for developing countries to develop their uh, credit markets. Which countries have been most success successful of th at that? What are the three reasons for that? And finally, which countries have recently implemented, or one reason is fine. Um, <laughs> uh, and which countries have most recently implemented a, a reforms to make them more effective at that? So which are the up and comers to invest in? <laughs> Short list. But um, I, I think what we m most need to move away from in international capital markets is debt finance and towards forms of finance where there, there's some kind of risk sharing. In the United States, when the stock market drops from 12,000 to 8,000, it's painful but it just doesn't cause nearly the problems that it does similar events do in an emerging market when, say, there's a depreciation of the exchange rate. And I think what the world needs to work towards is a risk-sharing mechanism where the, there's automatic burden sharing. And there are a number of proposals for this. I mean, the simplest one would be to have more investment go into uh, to force more investment into what we call direct foreign investment, which is where companies build factories abroad and share ownership and share production, and also into equity markets. Equity markets are very limited in emerging markets. But right now, the, the playing field is tilted very much towards borrowing. And part of the reason for that is if you make a loan to Argentina, you can enforce it in New York courts. And yes, New York courts leverage is limited, but it's not zero either. It's quite a pain in the neck. And I won't go into the details when they enforce judgments against you. And you can't do that with equity or direct foreign investment. And I think it would be better if when Argentina or Mexico had to borrow, all of the loans were adjudicated in their own courts. Now, when I wrote that proposal uh, 15 years ago with Jeremy Bulow, one reaction I got uh, in private correspondence from some leading lights of the day was, don't you realize these countries will never be able to borrow a penny? And I think we full well understood that that would be the case for some countries. We tried to soften what we were saying by a advocating $500 billion a year in aid at the same time. But I, I think if you look at the modern history of Latin America, that would have been better than, than what we saw. <laughs> 
My name is Ned Tebbets, and I'm a graduate of the Kennedy School and a fellow of the Society of Actuaries and a background in economics. I'm very concerned in the United States that the ratio of debt to income, in the case of the country as a whole, gross domestic product, uh, and the ratio, similar ratios for individual in the aggregate borrowing to income, and the ratio of corporate debt to income are uh, very high levels. I wonder if you could comment on how much further these ratios can increase without significant risk to the United States economy. <clears throat> Well, the risk that concerns me the most about U.S. debt levels is not the ones that you highlighted, but the United States is borrowing from the rest of the world, where it's borrowing 5% of income a year, which is just a huge amount. That's more than $500 billion. And the accumulated debt, we actually don't know exactly what it is. And when I say accumulated debt, I mean counting assets minus liabilities we built factories in France 50 years ago, try to add it all up. It, but it's something like 25 or 30 percent of income, which is just outside the bounds of anything that's ever been seen for a, for a large country. I consider that the biggest problem. The uh, corporate debt and household debt, I think, is uh, you know, a concern but less problematic. The capital markets are more sophisticated. On, on the consumer level, for example, there are all sorts of innovations in finance. Uh, involving uh, complex repackaging of mortgages and credit that allow uh, previously disenfranchised borrowers to be able to borrow, or borrow in a way that they didn't used to be. And some of what you see in the buildup of debts are new borrowers being brought in that weren't. I'm, I don't have quite as, uh, what shall I say, um, uh, positive a spin on this as you might hear the Federal Reserve give sometimes. But I, I don't, that's an issue, but I, to me, I don't think it's as big an issue as the country as a whole borrowing against the rest of the world. The debt we owe to ourselves is not as big a problem as what you owe to the rest of the world. Uh, yeah, my name's Varad Pandey. I'm an MPAID here at the Kennedy School. Uh, you mentioned that you can't compare the crisis countries to, say, India and China because their levels of per capita income are very different. Uh, do you think uh, countries like India and China have the risk of facing such crisis at high levels of per capita income as they grow? And if so, what can they do to prevent it? Well, I think uh, India and China absolutely do face the risk as they grow. It's more immediate in China than it is in India. Right now, as many of you have read about, one thing these countries are doing is trying to build up their reserve holdings that China holds. China, something like a $1.2 trillion economy, is holding 400, almost $450 billion in U.S. Treasury bills to try to protect itself because it knows that it has a very weak banking system. And India has over, uh, is a smaller economy, it's over, over $100 billion. Now, how much protection that affords, I don't know. I think as long as they have fixed exchange rates, these, which uh, China especially does, India is much more flexible than China. Many Asian economies have relatively fixed exchange rates. I think they'll find these reserves a Maginot line that it will not stop them from having a crisis. And I would point to the fact that, as my paper with Osfeld uh, many years ago mentioned, a lot of the European countries that got killed in the early 90s, they had tons of reserves. But if you look at the whole way a crisis evolves, it doesn't really protect you. What uh, I, th I think India is actually, despite people often point to China growing faster than India, India actually has more balanced growth in terms of its capital markets. They're much more sophisticated. Its exchange rate regime is more sophisticated uh, than China's. But I think both countries, if we look over the next 30 or 40 years, have risk. India, as I'm sure you know, is running a debt that makes the United States look uh, you know, like it's cautious. It, it has a, its government debt is something like 11 percent of GDP versus you know, five or six. The United States has been going like that for a while. And I think at some point, India is going to face a problem that they, they have this giant debt. and if they open up capital markets, they uh, domestically try to strengthen capital markets. It's going to make it harder to finance that debt. People have more choices. That's what a lot of financial repression is about. But 
On the other hand, if they don't, money won't be channeled efficiently and they'll have growth problems. And I, and I, I hope, I think both countries have excellent people in their, certainly at their central banks and, uh, you know, but, it, but it's, a, it's tough, it's a very tough problem. So they're, they're certainly at risk, although, you know, not, not in the next 12 months necessarily, but over the longer term, China sooner than India. Uh, sorry. Uh, Robert Smith, Turan Corporation. Uh, Turan Corporation trades emerging market debt. Uh, you had a good year last year. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Your comments on Venezuela. Uh, why is uh, Venezuela a problem if their foreign exchange reserves almost equal or are greater than the external debt that they owe to their foreign creditors? Well. Um, you know, uh, virtually every country can repay if they feel like it. Argentina could repay its debt today. I wouldn't advise it to fully repay its debt today necessarily, but it could if it wanted to. And a lot of whether countries default is a social, political judgment. So uh, many creditors feel Venezuela is okay because it has oil money and uh, because its, it's uh, total debt level is relatively low. Uh, my own view is it's riskier because it's erratic. I think the broader point is that the, the interest rates charged on, as you well know, emerging markets has become in just incredibly small. The average level uh, as, uh, it, it's as if you weren't going to have any significant defaults in the next couple of years. And, and to me, it just, doesn't, it just doesn't add up. So congratulations on your profit last year. <laughs> Hi, my name is David Lynch. I'm a PhD in public policy student. Um, you mentioned the spreads in Venezuela and Brazil are similar. Do you think that's because people think that they'll both be bailed out by the IMF, for instance, or do they, they don't recognize that the IMF's reserves are limited, or is it just that they're making bad decisions? I, th I think, as I said in my Newsweek piece, the, the driving force is that U.S. interest rates are so low at the moment. And if you look at the history of when we've had big inflows into emerging markets, it's often correlated with when interest rates are very, very low in the rich countries and people are just seeking uh, uh, higher returns. And I, I think that's the single uh, greatest driving force. It's, uh, I, I do think people were impressed by how successfully Brazil weathered its last storm. Brazil had a flexible exchange rate. It was really, the Brazil 2002 was the first crisis in a flexible exchange rate. And the flexible exchange rate made it possible in a way that I think wouldn't have been otherwise to have the smooth transition of power between presidents Cardoso and Lula. Uh, that, that said, Brazil's debt is still 55% of GDP, and it, it has, uh, it, I, I think it still is vulnerable. I wouldn't necessarily say it's exceptionally vulnerable in the club of 25 emerging markets, all of whom are somewhat vulnerable, but it's, it's, it has a long road ahead. For those of you that don't know, I mean, to, to meet its debt, Brazil has basically committed to run a surplus of on the order of three and a half or four percent a year. Turkey's more than six percent. And these are big numbers, and sometimes countries decide not to do that. If you look at what happens to a country when it experience, experiences the horrors of a debt restructuring that try to force its debt down, yeah, its GNP goes down, but actually never by much more than that. And so countries sometimes decide to, to, to restructure. Brazil is not about to do that in the foreseeable future, in the, in the near future. I will say that um, one, a, lot, a lot of people, and again, especially if you read some of the polemics about the IMF and the U.S. Treasury, think that they block debt restructurings. That, that's simply not true, that the, the player in the game who most doesn't want to have a debt restructuring is always the leaders in the developing countries because they will typically lose their job. Richard Cooper wrote about this, gosh, more than 30 years ago. He did a, a regression on how often finance ministers lost their job after an exchange rate devaluation. I may get it wrong, but I think it was, I think it was something like 85% of the time. Uh, 
and I think you'd see this with debt restructurings also. So, um, that, you know, they're, they're, they're fundamentally, every country could pay, but some of them would be ill-advised to repay in full, and I think uh, creditors have to take this into account. Hi, my name is Ajmal. I'm a first-year student at the Kennedy School. And I was wondering, um, you made mention of the fact that the IMF needs more funds to deal with the em emerging market crisis. And I was wondering, how much do you feel would be sufficient to deal with these emerging crises? And how do you feel is the best way to get countries to contribute more to the IMF? Now, uh, I actually, I, I was a little more careful than saying I thought the IMF needed the money. My own proposal from 15 years ago was actually to have all World Bank and IMF money be aid instead of loans to completely restructure these institutions. Uh, that it's no longer meaningful in today's world of deep capital markets to think about having an international lender of last resort. And uh, that's a controversial point of view, but I still, I still believe that that's where we're going to end up in 15 years. The, uh, the kind of numbers people throw out Stan Fisher has, I think, been a, was a forceful advocate of, of a big IMF. He said if the, you looked at the current IMF resources, which are about $120 billion, and this is a footnote, but if you, if you read the books, it says they're $240 million, about twice that. Well, a lot of that money is money from the Congo and whatever in their currency. No, no one could ever use it. It's not the euphemism. It's not convertible currency. It's really about $120 billion. And th there's all sorts of mumble jumble stuff about how it could be made bigger. Maybe it could be made to 160 or 180 if the G7 agreed. To get the same size IMF as was designed by Keynes and uh, White after World War II, you'd need about $2 trillion to be as big relative to world GDP. You, you just look at the size. If, when uh, India had a hiccup in 1991, it had a, a mini-crisis that it uh, navigated very successfully, led to its first generation reforms and a lot of growth. It practically wiped out the IMF just to make it what, what was the smallest possible loan to India. You know, China, I mean, there's no way it would be like bailing out New York State uh, or California, which <laughs> might need bailing out someday. <laughs> but uh, it, it, the resources aren't there. It's really a bit of a facade. It, the IMF did give Brazil $45 billion, which is very meaningful. But th there's a real question of, well, should it be giving Brazil $45 billion if it has $120 billion? And there, there, there are equity questions. It gave Turkey enormous loans that I don't think uh, let's just say many commentators said we're politically uh, driven, and uh, they're, they're question marks. I think the IMF right now has 80 percent of its resources tied up in four countries, something like that, and they're just, they're just limits to what it could do. And I, I personally think the future uh, wouldn't be to have a bigger IMF, but Stan Fisher, who I respect very much, has a different point of view. Yes. Jeremy Jen from the Kennedy School. I'm curious to get your thoughts on uh, the future of the dollar. Uh, do you think it'll continue to slide? And also on the Chinese yuan, do you think the Chinese government will choose to revalue or float the currency in the uh, near term? Well, um, I, uh, Dick had mentioned a paper that I wrote uh, early in my career. And one of my rules of thumb is when I write something earlier in my career and think something different later, I was usually right earlier in my career and not now. But I did write a paper in uh, uh, 2000 which argued that the U.S. current accounts were unsustainable. The dollar had to plunge dramatically. I presented this paper at what is the big annual meeting of central bankers, Alan Greenspan and many other uh, leaders go. and. Uh, I, without giving any individual's reaction, I mean, everybody thought it was ridiculous at the time that, you know, it wasn't going to happen. I didn't know I was going to the IMF. I was a Harvard professor, and I actually, I wrote that paper uh, based on some research I had done on, a, uh, on how transactions, frictions might help explain how difficult it is to unwind current accounts. The, um, <coughs> I, I, I still see uh, the dollar using that model, which I still think was right, 
I still see the trade-weighted dollar needing to go down another uh, 10 or 15 percent. And uh, Alan Greenspan spoken about this. He gave a speech saying he just thought financial markets were really deep and he didn't see the problem. I was the next speaker at that conference. And uh, I, I was very polite, but if I wasn't, I would have said, well, you know, Brazil and Argentina had really deep financial markets too, and look at how much good it did them. I, I, I think what matters is that the United States in trade is not as integrated, and that's why you need a big further movement in the dollar. With China, uh, I, I, think, uh, I, I think my view is that the Asian countries do ultimately need to bear some of the weight of the dollar's depreciation. It can't all fall on the euro, the pound, the Australian dollar. I think there are a lot of good reasons for that. And uh, I think at my last press conference I gave at the IMF in September of last year, I framed that by saying it's bad enough that the world is flying on one engine, the United States, but it'll be a lot worse if it has to land on one wheel which would be the euro, and I think that's necessary. And I, I, I do think that'll happen at some point, though how quickly and how dramatically uh, we'll see. I bet sometime this year we'll see some movement in the Chinese currency. I think we have time for one more question over here. Max Osofsky, I'm a second year student at the Harvard Business School. Uh, with Kerry emerging as the uh, front runner, uh, Bush has started to become more vocal about uh, defending his policies. Do you think having running now a 5% deficit as a percentage of D GDP is fiscally irresponsible or largely responsible for our economic recovery? Uh, try to try to tread a middle ground here. I, I first want to say I'm very happy that Kerry is a free trader. I mean, it's just a win-win uh, as far as that goes. And uh, I think that was a real concern because of the U.S. current account deficit. One of the worst things that can happen is what we do to ourselves. Of, uh, of closing up to trade. Uh, I, I think that uh, I have a concern that U.S. budget policy is rudderless. And it isn't so much that the level of the debt's out of control because it hasn't reached European levels. And the deficit's very large, but the United States ran big surpluses in the 90s, especially under Clinton, during a boom, and has some scope to do that. But what I see the concern is that we have Social Security and Medicare, which are clearly underfunded, and I, politically it's very understandable, the Medicaid legislation that must have added another $500 billion or so to the projected deficit on, on Medicaid. And the, I mean the, the budget situation is a problem. I think the Bush administration's answer to that is we'll take care of it later. But I mean, I've heard that song a lot around the world, and it, it worries me. So I, I, uh, I think that although the, the tax cuts and uh, loose Federal Reserve monetary policy was helpful getting out of the downturn, I, th I think at this point uh, it's not what the doctor called for anymore, that there needs to be some uh, closing up. And I would hope that both parties would responsibly point in that direction, although uh, I'm not sure we're going to see it. Thank you very much, Ken. That was great. For both of you. <laughs> Thank you very I, I want to close with some uh, pithy words uh, from a distinguished economist sitting to my left. Um, I won't get this exactly right, but he said, the United States is experiencing the best economic recovery money can buy. And if Europe wants to witness an economic recovery, it's going to have to turn on a TV set. Uh, this is not very optimistic uh, words. Um, and I hate to tell you, Ken has been very prophetic in the past. So I think you've heard important words, and I'm afraid you may have heard prophetic words tonight. I'm sure that Ken will spend a few minutes with anybody who would like to ask him some questions right after this uh, talk. Thank you. <laughs>